Good afternoon, everybody. How you guys doing? Ow! Good. I'm good. I'm glad that it's good. You know, everything was fine. And then class started, right? You'll think back on the term. Very good afternoon, everybody. How you guys doing? Ow! Good. I'm good. I'm glad that it's good. You know. Everything was fine and then class started, right? You'll think back on the term very fondly in those terms. Until I ate her and opened his mouth, everything was good, right? You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> I like you. Ah! Did you have a good break? Oh, yeah. Quiet group. <laughs> Nobody anything exciting? Six Say what? Six flags. I won't say what I thought you said. <laughs> but I can tell you it gave a very vivid image. Let me tell you. <laughs> six flags. Nobody can top six flags? Stagecoach ride. A stagecoach ride? Where at? Well, like it's, uh, Columbia. It's a mining town in California. Oh, cool. It was their birthday. Like, apparently, they've been around for over 100 years. Sutter's Mill? Uh, it's a, I think it's a bit more uh, south of there. Yeah. You guys want me to just start talking? I mean, come on. If you don't talk, then I'll just dive into biochemistry. Let's do this. That's what we're here the for. sooner we get started, the sooner we get it over with. Is that the thinking? Yeah. Take a deep breath to get it over with. All right. We'll do that in a minute. But I'd like to get to know you a little bit before I get started. So uh, let me tell you a bit about myself. And I'll tell you a little bit about the TAs. And then I'd like to learn a little bit about you. So. Uh, my name is Kevin Ahern, and um, I will be your instructor this term. And uh, this is one of my funner classes to teach, and I like having fun when I teach. And this is also a more challenging class to teach, and the reason is because, as you're going to discover, we're going to go through a lot of material in this term. Okay, you probably have heard that about the class before, and it's true. We cover a lot of territory. The good news is that we don't go into it in as much depth as we do in my other classes. But because of that, it means we scan through a lot of material. So we're going to cover all of biochemistry in one term. And so I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that my heart goes out to you doing all of biochemistry in one term. That's a lot of stuff, OK? It's also a kind of a tough term because the class meets on Monday, when, but Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And Friday, let's be honest, nobody wants to come to class on Friday. You know, you think about Friday and you think it's spring and it's 70 degrees out there and who wants to go listen to Ahern talk, especially when he's got that video camera sitting back over there because he videotapes all of his lectures and, you know, I can just watch the video later and I really don't need to go to class. And I have that video camera there for a very good purpose and that purpose is to help you to learn the material. And, there's times you can't make it to class. That's, that's why it's there. I've got a couple students that contacted me earlier and said they were having trouble getting back from spring break and probably some more glamorous place than Six Flags. I don't know where they were at, but they, they were having trouble getting back. And it doesn't get more glamorous than that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, maybe they were coming back from Six Flags. I don't know. Uh, but it's there for those sorts of situations, OK? Um, I, want that, I want that camera to be helpful to you and beneficial to you. And the deal I make with the students in the class is that the camera will be there as long as you're here. OK? So when you stop showing up for class, all right, then the camera's going to go away. Because what the camera's doing then is it's really stopping you from being able to do the things that you need to do. OK? Now, I don't do that to be mean. And I don't do that because my ego says that I have to have a full class, because I really don't believe that. But I do know from experience that students who are in class are those who do better. All right, um, and you'll see. And I and I, I do this data every year. I do. I'll do it again this year. But I, I give um, what I call extra credits on days when the class size is small. So if it's a nice day outside and you're seeing it's really beautiful outside, and I, want, I don't want to go listen to Ahern, then that's probably a pretty good chance you're going to see a pop quiz that day. A pop quiz. A, I shouldn't say a quiz because it's actually extra credit. I'm going to see extra credit on that day because I'm actually surveying what's happening with your grades. And I'll tell you what I found over the years in doing that little survey. 
you do get extra credit. Okay? So if you come to class and you take that, it's going to boost you compared to if you don't. All right? So that's one thing. And the other is when I look at who's coming to class, because that's, that's the only time I take attendance is then, and who's not coming to class, it's remarkable the difference in the grades. Okay? It's remarkable the difference in the grades. Okay? Two-thirds of the people who are in class are above the average on the days when I give that. And two-thirds of the people who are gone are below the average. All right? Now, coincidence, I would say, well, maybe, but the reality is, is that I've done it for many years, and it's the same year in and year out. It's going to pay you to come to class. Okay? So come to class, keep the camera rolling, keep Kevin happy, and we'll all be happy. Okay? Okay. So I love teaching. I love teaching this class, and I have gotten to know many wonderful students over the years with this class, and I'm sure this, this term will be the same. I like to interact with you. I really enjoy interacting with you. I really enjoy getting to know you, and I enjoy helping you. And my job is to do that. If you don't come in, I can't help you. Okay? And um, well, I guess that's that. If you don't come in, I can't help you. So um, if you come in, you're, you're having difficulty, I can help you, and I'm happy to do that. I've also got two excellent TAs um, this year um, who will also be uh, available to meet with you, especially if you think I'm too big and hairy, which, of course, I'm not. But um, I'm supposed to laugh at that. They didn't laugh at that or nothing. <laughs> These guys haven't heard it at all. These guys, have heard, they've heard it many times. OK. Anyway, uh, let me introduce them to you first. Uh, you'll have some inter interactions with them. On the end is Maria Nguyen. Uh, Maria is a senior in biochemistry and biophysics. It's the first time she has been my TA. Uh, and sitting next to her is Margot Romilly, who is also a senior in biochemistry and biophysics. And it is the first time she has been my TA. They have heard all my jokes, but they haven't had the joyful experience of having me as the instructor. Right. OK. So um, that's a little bit about me. That's a little bit about um, the course. My philosophy is um, I really uh, want you to help. I want to help you to learn. Now let's get to know you a little bit, and I will do that with a sort of a simple survey first. How many people in here are majoring in nutrition dietetics? Oh yeah, that's not uncommon. Okay, those were all the F's. Okay, and then that's a that's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> Get off on the wrong foot here, guys. We don't want to do this on the first day. This is really bad. Set the tone for the whole term. Um, how many people in here are in botany plant pathology? One. OK. I used to have, there was, there used to be, uh, two years ago when I taught this class, there was this group of botany plant pathology, and they all sat in the same place, and I called them the botany mafia. And after I, after I called them that, I, I had the feeling they really were, because they started showing up in strange places. I was worried it was being followed or something. I didn't know. So I hope you're not part of the botany mafia. Um, how many people in some aspect of engineering? Okay, all right. What, what, what? chem? Chemical, okay, yeah, that's usually what, what, what it is. BioE, of course, takes BB450, but I do see some chemies in there. How many people in here um, are pre-health of some sort? Oh, okay, all right. So, pre-pharmacy? No. Pre-dentistry? Pre... -dentistry? pre Medical, this probably isn't the best for pre-medical, I'll tell you. And uh, uh, pre-PT, pre-PA, okay, okay. And uh, some other pre, I have it, pre-optometry? Did I miss a pre? Pre-vet. Pre-vet, oh yeah, pre-vet. Sorry, that's usually a pre pretty decent number. One, other pre-vets? One, okay, well, well. <laughs> you're all by yourself back there. Okay, so... Um, how many people are afraid getting started? Be honest, I won't bite you. Okay. How many people have heard horror stories about biochemistry? Oh, yeah, yeah. Urban legends out there, right? So I won't ask how many have heard horror stories about me. I don't want to know. <laughs> That's a joke, too. But um, uh, anyway, um, one of the things that I think is important when you're learning is that. I'm a very big believer in the power of positive thinking. I think that the more you convince yourself something is going to be awful, the more likely it is to be awful. Not because it actually is, but because you've got your mindset on that. Okay? And it's one of the reasons I find that personal meetings with students really do make a difference, because I think they cut through 
that awfulness component that students frequently uh, feel or hear about from various things. Um, I'm an advisor in biochemistry and biophysics. And so in my major, and you say, oh, wow, the students are really taking really tough classes and so forth. Well, they have the same fears. They have the same thoughts that you have. They just have them for different classes. And so we have a class that students in our major take called physical chemistry. Okay? And so the legends are out there about physical chemistry. You're going to die doing physical chemistry. You're gonna, it's going to be awful doing physical chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And physical chemistry is a tough class, no question about it. But a pretty decent percentage of the difficulties people have with the class are actually the anxiety they have with the class. And it has very little to do with the class itself. So I tell my students that you've got to um, cut through that. Okay? Because the more you're worried about something, the less efficient you are as a learner. Okay? You've got to get through that. So once you cut through that, then I think you have the ability to get on top of things. And I won't tell you that there are perfect instructors on the campus, whether they're in physical chemistry or they're in this class, because there aren't any. Okay? But the best that you can do for yourself is to keep an open mind and to uh, go forward. All right? And if you think positive and you look at things in a positive fashion, you're much more likely to be successful than if you look at it with anxiety. Now that I've totally scared you, should I start? Okay, so uh, today is gonna be fairly casual. You're seeing I'm sitting up here talking like this, and um, I'm gonna talk about some very general things about biochemistry. Um, there's not gonna be much that on, of what I will talk about today that you're really gonna be responsible for. I'm gonna tell you uh, one of my rules of thumb for preparation in the class. And one of the rules of thumb is that um, what I talk about in the class is the most important thing. My guideline in general, with sort of an exception today, but my guideline in general is if I talk about it in class, it's fair game. All right? You say, oh, wow, he can do a lot of talking, right? Well, A, I'm not going to go pick nitpicky things uh, to ask you about because I, that doesn't really prove anything, okay? I try to keep things as general as I can in the questions that I ask. There will be some specifics to be sure, but I try to keep things as general as I can to try to hit the major points that I talk about. That's very important. Second, I can assure you, and there's a, there's a book for the course. It's a free book for the course. How many people have gotten the book for the course? Okay. Um, get it? It's, it's a free book. It's a free download. It doesn't cost you a dime. Um, I can assure you there will be nothing that, if I don't talk about it, that I will ask you about. That is, if I don't talk about it, I'm not going to ask you a question about it. So the book is there to supplement your knowledge. Okay? So I want you to use that book to help enhance your knowledge, to help learn about things that maybe you're curious about, and to maybe see things explained in a different way than I explained in class. Since I wrote the book, it's probably not going to sound much different, but hopefully uh, that'll be a benefit to you. Okay? And last, I also, at the end of every class, is I write highlights. And those highlights are my um, sort of recollection of the, and by the way, my memory is terrible, my recollection of what I saw as the most important things I talked about. Okay? So you can use those as a guide for studying. I'm a big fan, a very big fan of writing things down. Okay? As a tool for studying, writing things down is one of the best things that you can do. I find highlighting really doesn't teach anybody anything. Okay? So highlighting and color coding while they look really nice, they aren't necessarily uh, the best ways to study. Study involves writing things down. So if you do that, I think you'll do yourself a great favor. Okay, um, with respect to the videos, I try to get them posted within 24 hours of um, having recorded them. It does take a fair amount of rendering, and it does take a fair amount of time. So that's one of the reasons I want to see that they're being used properly, and that you guys keep coming to class and so forth, and we'll be fine on the videos. Stop coming to class, you'll lose extra credit, and uh, the videos may stop too. Okay? Is that a deal? All right. Let's get started. So, um, what you see on the screen is the class uh, page. And um, the uh, page has the syllabus on it. Syllabus is required reading. One question on the first exam will come straight from the syllabus. Okay? So you need to read the syllabus. It's a requirement that you read the syllabus in the class. Okay? The syllabus can be downloaded on here. You can download it right here where it says here. If you haven't downloaded the book, you can download the book right here. Okay? That's a long download. Depending on how fast your uh, connection is, it can take a half an hour. So give it time. And as I said in the email I sent to you this weekend, the Chrome browser is the one browser that seems to have some issues with it. So if you're using Chrome, you might want to uh, try a different browser. OK. I will lecture directly from uh, the stuff that you see on the screen. I don't use PowerPoint. 
Okay, I will organize my slides into a PowerPoint, but I don't use PowerPoint because PowerPoint doesn't give me flexibility. PowerPoint is a clunky thing, okay? It's clunky, click, 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 forwards, 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 backwards, 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 forwards, forwards, forwards. You're getting stuck in these things, right? Well, with this thing, I can pretty much uh, look at this and decide where I'm gonna go with stuff, all right. And I can adjust accordingly, so I'm not stuck or constrained by PowerPoint. All right, well, I'd like to start the class off thinking about what I describe as the foundations of biochemistry. Biochemistry um, is a discipline that is relatively young, okay? The roots of biochemistry go way back um, into the 1700s or 1800s, where people first started thinking about the um, reason that cells were alive and other things weren't alive. Okay? And by the way, anything that you're responsible for today, I will tell you. So I'm just kind of blithering and blathering about things today, just kind of get, just get the mood set. Okay. So when they first started thinking about biochemistry, uh, the term didn't exist, of course. But they were very curious about what separated living systems from other systems, okay? Why is a cell alive and a rock is not, okay? And that's a philosophical question at one level, but it's also a very uh, practical and a biochemical question at, a, at another level, okay? Thinking about what was it that made an organism alive um, is something that probably has permeated all of human history, okay? We have this notion, or people had a notion for a long time, that human beings were something that was very different from the rest of the living uh, world. But one of the things I think, and I hope that you'll learn this term, is that human cells are really no different than anybody else. You're going to be astonished to see how similar in, not uh, necessarily structure, but how similar in organization human cells are to bacterial cells. The simplest bacterium on the face of the earth has much more similarity to your cells than you would ever imagine, okay? People didn't know that at the time. A bacterium doesn't look anything like a human cell. In fact, back in the beginning of time, people didn't know bacteria existed. Bacteria, as far as anybody was concerned, was a demon, right? A demon was something that came and something that attacked you Maybe it was an evil spirit, or maybe it was whatever it was. That was the explanation for what happened when people got sick. Okay? Well, we know the causes of sickness today. We know they're viruses. We know they're bacteria. We know, in some cases, they are genetics. Okay? At that time, they didn't know that. So this quest for understanding what was alive has really been driving biochemistry. Okay. If we fast forward to the 1700s, we get the first glimpses of what I call biochemistry, and this was the invention of the microscope. The microscope told us for the first time that organisms were subdividable. That was that a liver wasn't a thing. A liver was something that was composed of individual cells. It told us that cells were the basic living unit in the universe, at least the universe of the Earth. All right. They were the basic living unit. We discovered because we had microscopes in the 1700s for the first time that there were what they, <coughs> excuse me, described as animalcules. Animalcules, I like that name, right? An animalcule is a combination of an animal and a molecule, right? So an animalcule is a little tiny animal, and that was their way of describing what we now call as bacteria, okay? Back, animalcules, of course, uh, became later known as bacteria, but even in our bodies, we found that we had individual cells too. And so the question then arose, well, if that an organism has individual cells and an individual cell is the fundamental unit of life, then there must be some fundamental difference between a bacterial cell and a human cell, or between a human cell and a dog cell, or between a dog cell and a mouse cell. Okay? Well, there are differences between those. There are differences that we can see between a liver cell and a kidney cell in the same organism. DNA-wise, they're not. But the appearance-wise, and the, for, for the, uh, practical purposes, they behave as different kinds of cells. They are different. So something told people that there was something fundamentally different okay, that made cells be different. What was it? Was it the fact that they were created differently? Was it the fact that there was something else that we didn't know? Okay. 
Well, around the time we started understanding what cells were, people began to understand what the fundamental units of the universe were as well. We know them, of course, as atoms. Okay? It was clear that there were little invisible things that were there that were the, the roots of everything. Could it be that atoms were actually at the root of cells? People toss that idea around a lot. And for a long time, people felt that there has to be something different about cells. Maybe, maybe atoms exist, maybe molecules exist, and maybe chemistry exists, but whatever exists, it has to be something different inside of a, human, uh, inside of a cell because that's magic. As late as the early 1900s, people were saying, there's so much complexity inside of a cell, we will never understand what makes an organism be alive. Never say never. Okay? We will never understand what makes an organism be alive. Now, what may come as a bit of a shock to you is uh, it wasn't until about the 1930s that a man, excuse me, <coughs> that a man named Schrodinger came up with a very radical idea. And his radical idea was that all of the things that we see in biology have their roots in molecules. It was finally, formally accepted. It had previously been shown that the chemistry that was going on inside of living organisms wasn't any different than what was going on outside of a cell. The chemistry was the same. The things that were made inside of a cell could be made in a test tube outside the cell. That wasn't a problem. But for the first time, Schrodinger says, there is the root of all living systems. It's not the cell. The root is in the molecules. Okay? That was the very first, what I call, foundation of a discipline we call today molecular biology. You've all heard the term molecular biology. You probably never thought what that meant. Oh, it's molecular biology. It's DNA, it's RNA, it's protein. Yeah, it has all those things. But molecular biology means that at the root of every living system are molecules. And the differences we see between different cells are due to the molecules themselves. Okay? Well, that was a great idea. Nobody really knew what that meant okay? until somebody finally sat down and said, well, we know that cells can transmit information from one to the next. Mendel showed with his peas that traits could be inherited. How is it that information can get passed along? So it was a big race to find out how that information could get passed along. You know the results of that race. The race was settled in 1953 when Watson and Crick, using data they stole from Rosalind Franklin, it's a true story, they stole the data, using data they stole from Rosalind Franklin, told them the structure of DNA. DNA was the genetic material. Here was how the information was passed. Case closed, right? Not quite, okay? Well, the case didn't close because that was really opening doors. All kinds of doors were opened. Wow, here's DNA. Subsequently, RNA was discovered. Okay. I shouldn't say discovered. It was known before then. But subsequently, the role of RNA became quite clear. Okay. The relationship between DNA, RNA, and protein became known. All right. And today, we take for granted. I, was, I talked to a group of high school students this past week. And I'm sitting there talking, showing them a, a molecule of DNA. I've got a 3D classroom. People put on the goggles. They can see the, everything in 3D. Right? The things are out in the classroom, and they're all going, ooh, wow, oh, wow. And it's, it's really cool. I'll show you guys sometime if you want to see it. Okay? And they're looking at this stuff, and I'm sitting there going, you know, everybody knows. If I say, you know, DNA, and I say, what goes with T, I know what you're going to tell me. And they all say, A. And if I say G, you're going to say C. Every school kid knows now what nobody knew 60 years ago. Okay? Remarkable. Well. Since then, we now know the sequence of all the DNA of the human genome. We know the sequence of organisms, blah, blah, blah. We know so much about what's happening inside of our cells that we can't literally pick up a newspaper today and learn and, and, and not see something in there about some new biotech advance, some new medical advance, et cetera. That's happening because of this explosion of knowledge that we've had in molecular biology and biochemistry. Okay? So to me, that's what's really exciting. That's what's wonderful. It's a wonderful time to be alive. It's a wonderful time to see the advances. Um, I will tell you how old I am. When I was uh, a graduate student here at Oregon State back in the 1980s, before most of you were born, okay? when I was a graduate student back here in the 19, middle of the 1980s, my thesis advisor wanted to give me a project for my PhD thesis. Okay? 
His project he wanted to give me was he wanted me to isolate and sequence a human gene, the gene that's involved in DNA replication. And he said, I think this would be a good project for you. What do you think? And I said, well, let me think about it. So I went home and I thought about it and I looked it over and I decided and I came back to him and I told him, I said, it's too complicated. Too complicated. Today, I could take any person in this room, I could take a high school student, and with the tools that we have available, you could isolate that same gene overnight with no training whatsoever. That tells you that a revolution has happened. A revolution has happened not only in the technology, but in our knowledge and our ability to do things. Okay? It also tells you how old I am. Okay? That's really remarkable. Okay? We take these things for granted. And these advances are happening daily. This is a world that's going by very rapidly. And when we see these things that we pick up and we read in the, in the newspaper about these advances, they're happening because of these advances in technology. Okay? So I'm going to spend some, a little bit of time during the term talking about various techniques, various technologies, not to uh, bore you with techniques, but to show you some of the really remarkable things that we can do. All right, enough of the background here. Now, I didn't, you notice I didn't say anything in there about you're responsible for any of that. Okay? Even though some of you are writing this down, I think that's good. That's very good. Get in the habit of writing things down. Okay. Um, you've all had organic chemistry. In some cases, I know some of you haven't finished your organic chemistry, and I've advised you not to take it if you haven't finished your organic chemistry, but you're here anyway. Okay? Fortunately, I don't teach this class as an organic chemistry class. Okay? There are some basic things about organic chemistry that I expect everybody will know, and um, those uh, things, okay? basic names, aldehydes, carboxylic acids, we'll talk about those a lot, <laughs> ketones, amides, amines, esters, etc. Okay? So when I talk about those, you should have some understanding about what they are. Um, and I'm not going to go back and review organic chemistry with you. Okay. We know, um, actually, I'm not going to go through that. Okay. The magic that happens inside of cells, okay? If people wanted to have magic. They had magic because they couldn't understand. They didn't have the tools to analyze what was happening inside of cells. And when we don't have the tools to analyze something and we don't have knowledge, we're very frequently going to call it magic or we're going to call it demons. Right? Magic for the good stuff, demons for the bad stuff. Right? Well, the magic that happened inside of cells was the fact that cells could duplicate themselves. Cells could reproduce. Cells could take in energy and... Um, make great things. Well, the magic that happens inside of cells happens because of macromolecules. Here's something you should know. Macromolecules include things like DNA. DNA is the biggest molecule in your cells by a long ways. And nothing's even close. Nothing is even close to your DNA. I'll give you an example. Your DNA in one cell. How, how many people know how big one of your cells in your body is? It may give me a number. For how many, how many meters is one cell of your body? Five nanometers. Okay, it's too small. Micrometers. Too small. Micro. Okay, five micrometers is pretty close. Five micrometers is pretty close. About one to five microns. Okay, that's one to five millionths of a meter. Smaller than your eye can see. Your naked eye can see. You need a microscope to see it. That's why people didn't know we had cells until they had microscopes. But in that cell that's smaller than your eye can see resides, and I'm not making this up, seven feet of DNA. There's seven feet of DNA in every one of your cells. I kid you not. Okay? If you took all the DNA of all the cells of your body and you stretched it end to end, you go to the sun and back. You've got over 180 million miles of DNA in your body. Now you know why you feel tired this afternoon. You're carrying around 180 million miles of DNA every time you take a step. Right? Okay, so DNA by a long ways is the largest molecule in your body. Okay, related molecule in your body, RNA. RNA structurally is very similar to DNA. But 
RNA is slightly chemically different and it's smaller. RNAs are made much smaller. They're made from the DNA and they're made in little tiny pieces. Okay? RNAs are much more abundant. We have thousands, millions of them inside of our cells, but we don't have the length of the RNAs in, us, in our cells. Okay. Proteins. Proteins are, you're going to hear this over and over and over, especially in the first couple weeks of the course, proteins are the workhorses of the cell. Proteins catalyze the reactions. Those are known as the enzymes. Proteins communicate information. They're used in a process we call signaling. By the way, whenever I go too fast, just raise your hand and say, hey, Kevin, slow down. Okay? I won't stop pacing, though. I always pace. If you really want to see something funny, all you have to do is watch the video at fast speed, and you'll see me going, ding, 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 ding. Nervous habits are hard to break, right? Okay, so proteins um, do, the, they catalyze the reactions, okay? They do signaling. They let cells talk to each other. They give structural integrity, okay? They give cells some structure. And in some cases, they give organismal integrity, okay? Your fingernails, your hair, okay? Those are proteins. Okay. And the last micro, macro, blah, 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 macromolecule that we'll be concerned with uh, are, is the uh, um, polysaccharides. Okay. These come in a variety of forms and they're used for a variety of purposes. We use polysaccharides in our body primarily to store energy. And most organisms have some sort of energy storage they do with polysaccharides. But others like plants, for the botanist, botany plant pathology people in here, plants use polysaccharides for structural integrity of their cells. <coughs> they actually make up the cell walls. Okay. Now, um, the building blocks of the macromolecules, and we're going to talk more about these later, but I'll just mention them now. For proteins, the building blocks are amino acids. Amino acids. Okay. There are 20 amino acids that occur in all organisms, and those 20 amino acids are used to make all proteins. There are a few rare amino acids that are occasionally used to make proteins in addition, but they're extraordinarily rare. Okay? For all practical purposes, there are 20 amino acids that make up proteins. The building blocks for Nucleic acids, and by the way, nucleic acids is a term that includes both DNA and RNA. The building blocks of nucleic acids are the nucleotides. Now you think of them as A, G, C, T, but that's only a part of the nucleotide, as we will see. The A is only a part of a nucleotide, but we won't worry about that today. Okay. And the building blocks of the polysaccharides, of course, are the sugars. All right. DNA has this great property of being able to replicate itself. I don't need to tell you this. You already know this. Wherever there's a G, it can be replaced on the other strand by a C. Wherever there's a T, another strand by an A. If it's RNA, as we have here, U and A instead of A and T, etc. But the point is that there's information contained in a strand of DNA or RNA, and that information can be used to make additional copies. And that's a very, very valuable and important trait. I kind of like this structure, self-replicating molecules. We think that life on Earth evolved originally from molecules that started to replicate themselves. Okay? Started to replicate themselves. We know in very simple chemistry that it's possible to start making macromolecules. We know in the conditions of primordial Earth that those macromolecules can connect with each other and those, those macromolecules under certain conditions can start to copy themselves. And we think that was actually the origins of life on Earth. Okay. Now, here's your biology lesson for the day. Okay. Everybody's frowning. I've never seen just such a frowny class. Why are you frowning? Nobody wants to look at me. Once I say that, nobody wants to look at me. Everybody starts smiling. <laughs> Are you guys going to be my frowniest class ever or what? 
Maybe we're just focusing. You're just focusing. Do you, fo do you frown when you're, when you're really learning things? Maybe? Well, that's good. So if, you, if frowning means that you're learning, then I'm all in favor of frowning. But usually it means <laughs> I can't stand your guts. <laughs> okay, I don't know. So maybe I should tell you a joke. You want a joke? Sure. If I tell you a joke, will you promise to laugh? Yes. You promise? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. You have to laugh too. So this is, this is one of my favorite jokes of all time. Okay? All of my jokes are one of my favorite jokes of all time. But this is right now one of my favorite jokes of all time. Okay? So this joke, all right? So there's this little guy named Artie that wants to be a hitman. If you heard this joke, please don't give it away. Okay? He wants to be a hitman. He wants to go kill people for a living, and she's rolling her eyes. You've heard this joke, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. He wants to be a hitman, right? So he goes out, and he puts up signs around the neighborhood. It says, you know, willing to kill somebody for cheap, right? If you want to get started, you've got to do it for cheap. You give away your services. People get your, work, get your reputation out there. Next thing you know, people start paying you a lot of money to do what you want to do, right? So Artie goes out there, and he puts up the signs, and it says, you know, we'll kill somebody for cheap. Puts his phone number down there, you know, and... He's sitting around the house, and the phone rings and says, Hey, uh, are you Artie? And he goes, Yeah. Well, it's how I get somebody I want you to kill. Oh, good, good. He says, I want you to kill my wife. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. He says, uh, How much are you going to charge? He said, Well, I said, I'd do it for cheap. He said, how's a, how's a dollar? And I said, That sounds good to me. He says, Can you kill her right now? He said, Well, yeah, sure. I'll put my pants on, you know, go, go get dressed and go out. And, Where's she at? He says, Well, she's down at the grocery store. So he gives her the directions of the grocery store, gives, her a description, gives Artie a description of what, what she looks like and everything. And so he goes down there and, and he looks around the grocery store for somebody meeting this description and he looks and all of a sudden, oh, there she is. She's over there, right? So he goes tip, 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 tiptoeing, you know, and he gets up there and he sneaks up and he grabs her from behind and he chokes her to death right there in the grocery store, okay? Strangles her right there in the grocery store, okay? He's feeling pretty good. He's turning around and trying to get away, and he looks around and goes, somebody saw him. Right? Well, they can't have a witness because he's not going to you know, be a hitman for very long with a witness. So he goes over and he grabs the witness, and he grabs and he strangles them right there in the grocery store as well. He's feeling, okay, now he makes his getaway. And I, da, 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 there's somebody over here, right? It's just my lucky day, right? Every time I turn around, there's somebody that's seen me kill somebody, right? So he goes over and he strangles this person. He goes running out. He thinks he's making his great escape, but the police catch him, sadly. And the headlines in the newspaper the next day read, Artie chokes three for a dollar at the grocery store. <laughs> I can tell by the groans that not everybody had heard that joke before. Artie, you see, he was, okay. Now, if you go tell all your friends next year when I go tell that joke, everybody will have heard it, right? So don't tell, don't tell next year's class that joke. That'll be good. Okay. Here's your biology lesson. I have to tell you a joke before I tell you your biology lesson, all right? How many people like freshman biology? Okay, two people. Well, I won't ask how many didn't like freshman biology, but I have a feeling I know. Okay, freshman biology, um, cell biology, all right? So... Uh, I'll talk, the reason I bring this up is I will talk this term a fair amount about um, different cell types. Okay? So there are really three major divisions of cell types on the face of the earth. Prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, and what are called the Archaeans. The Archaeans are a very odd group of, of cells. We're learning a lot more about them um, uh, since they've been discovered relatively recently, uh, meaning in the last 30 years or so. Uh, but um, I'm, we're not going to say much about the Archaeans. We will focus an awful lot on the most common types of cells that we find, which are the bacteria, known as the prokaryotes, that's P-R-O-K-A-R-Y-O-T-E-S, and the eukaryotes, which include things like animals, cats, dogs, plants, fungi, okay? So multicellular organisms will always be eukaryotic. Multicellular organisms will always be eukaryotic. Yes, you need to know this, okay? There are some unicellular eukaryotic organisms. They include yeast, stuff you make bread and beer with. Okay? Yeast are unicellular eukaryotic organisms. But there are no multicellular prokaryotic organisms. All the prokaryotic organisms are unicellular. 
We call them bacteria most commonly. Okay? Now, there are differences in these organisms um, from a visible point of view. Right? Bacteria, first of all, are considerably smaller than eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are smaller. Okay? Prokaryotic cells are much simpler in appearance. Prokaryotic cells, for example, don't have a nucleus. They don't have organelles. They don't have mitochondria. They don't have, excuse me, they don't have endoplasmic reticulum. They're basically what people describe as a bag of enzymes and DNA. And that's what they are. There's no division of things into, into separate regions like there, are, there is in eukaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, we see organization. We see a nucleus where the DNA and the RNA are found. Okay? We see an, uh, a mitochondrion where the energy is made. We see lysosomes that are involved in breaking things down. We see the endoplasmic reticulum, which is involved in trafficking and modifying proteins. Okay? So fundamental differences in the cell types, and we'll say more about those. Now, despite those fundamental differences, what we're going to see is that down at the molecular level, there's not much difference. There's really not very much difference between bacteria and between cells of eukaryotes. Okay. I like that picture. Kind of cool. E. coli, the most abundant organism in your gut. How many people in here have ever worked with E. coli in the laboratory? What does it smell like? S-H-I-T. That's what gives, that's what gives your doo-doo the smell. They're very commonly used in laboratories not to punish students, but rather because they're extraordinarily studied. Extremophiles. These uh, include some bizarre things that come from bizarre regions of Earth. They're commonly Archean organisms. Not always, but they're commonly Archean organisms. This is something from a, I think it's a sulfur pit um, in Yellowstone Park. Oop, didn't mean to do that. Okay. And the eukaryotic cells, we get to them. Here's uh, a representation now of some of the structures that we see inside of there. Okay. So we've got uh, the nucleus, and I'm not going to go back and ask you to label and do all this sort of stuff. I think you should know some general things about the organelles like I have mentioned to you. Just very general things about the, the organelles. All right. One of the things students sometimes find surprising is the fact that cells, just like our body, also have a skeleton. We call it a cytoskeleton. And you can see it depicted. It's been stained here. Uh, very cool for you to see, nice and clear. That cytoskeleton gives cells some structure. And it's something that has to be manipulated very um, uh, continuously by cells to uh, perform the things that they do. Okay, let's see. Energy. One of the things we're going to talk about this term a lot is energy. Okay, Because energy is necessary for living organisms. We're going to see why. I'll tell you why briefly. We're going to see why later when we talk more about the Gibbs free energy. Energy is necessary to organize. Energy is necessary to organize. How many people know what entropy is? <clears throat> Everybody knows what entropy is. Describe entropy to me. What's entropy? Uh, things continually fall apart or break down. Yeah. Chaos. Things will tend to move to disorder instead of moving towards order. Right? There are people who mistakenly think that because things move towards disorder, or at least we think they move towards disorder, that that's got to be wrong because when we look at cells, they're very ordered. And if things went towards disorder, how, could it, how in the world can we be ordered? How can we have such order in the things that we do if the universal tendency is towards disorder? Okay. Well, the answer is, the ex analogy I like to give is the deck of cards. The deck of cards, you take, you throw up in the air, you pick up all the cards. Most likely, they're not organized. Ace, king, queen, jack, blah, blah, blah. They're going to be in a sort of a random order, right? If you sit down and you spend some time playing solitaire and you organize those cards, they then end up being ace, king, queen, jack, 10, 9, 8, blah, 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 right? How did that happen? Well, it happened because you put energy into it. Putting energy into things enables order to be possible. Putting energy 
into the universe, allows your cells to organize themselves and fight that constant battle of entropy. Cells are fighting that battle constantly. If they have no energy, they lose the battle. Without energy, you lose the battle against entropy. Okay? Cells cannot be chaotic. Cells cannot live in a totally jumbled world. They have to be able to maintain some control. That control happens because of energy. The energy that happens in our cells is stored in a couple of different important forms. The immediate form energy is stored in, in our cells is ATP. Everybody knows that? ATP is the gasoline of cells. Adenosine triphosphate. Okay. Why is it stored there? Well, it turns out that when you put phosphates chemically joined next to each other, they really don't like to be chemically joined next to each other. Phosphates are negatively charged. Put three phosphates, one phosphate, another phosphate, another phosphate next to each other. You've got three things that want to repel each other, and they're chemically tied together. All right? They're chemically tied together. When you allow them to fly apart, they do. Like a bat out of hell. They release energy. When you break the bond, the energy is released. The phosphate goes flying away. And that energy can be used to do something. Okay? So ATP is our most immediate source of energy. We store energy with a variety of molecules. We store it in the form of fat. We store it in the form of carbohydrates. We even store it in the form of proteins, although that's not used primarily as an energy source in our cells, that is. Okay. From a nutrition point of view, proteins are a very important source of energy for those of you who are in nutrition because, not because our cells are using it as an energy source, but because we're eating it and using the energy of some other cell to power things for us. When we think about things like Atkins diet, for example. Okay. Atkins diet is um, a high protein, low carbohydrate diet. And if that energy were not in the proteins, people on Atkins diet would lose weight even faster than they do. They still lose weight reasonably fast. Okay, but for our cells, phosph phosphates linked together in the form of ATP are an immediate source of energy and used universally throughout our cells. Okay, and the last thing I'll finish with here today, actually that's not the, that, that, that's just a silly example. The last thing I'll finish is actually describing something to you. I like this example though because this example tells us that Energy can be stored in some pretty amazing ways and do some pretty amazing things. Electric eels can electrocute. You can kill you with the electric voltage that they build up. Okay? So we think of energy in terms of heat. We think in terms of energy in terms of mechanical things. We don't always think, think of biological energy in terms of electrical. But as we will see, biological energy is, in fact, electrical as well. Okay? We talk about nerve transmission, for example. We're going to see that there's an electrical component to that. Okay? Very important to understand. What I wanted to finish with, I thought I had a slide, but I guess I didn't put that in there, was uh, a description of potential energy versus kinetic energy. Okay? Potential versus kinetic energy. All right? You guys have seen the example. You've got the ball up the hill. The ball rolls up the hill. Balls don't roll up hills. You have to roll balls uphill, by the way. There's this thing called gravity. Right? Ball up the hill has potential energy. You have to put energy in there to get it up there. You have to put energy into a molecule to make ATP. ATP is potential energy. It can be used for something, right? The ball rolls down the hill, kinetic energy. We see it, the energy being released and the fact that it's moving down the hill, gravi gravity is pulling it down. The loss of that energy in the form of ATP is the phosphate being cleaved and that <coughs> phosphate flying away. Exactly the same sort of thing, just at a molecular level instead of a macroscopic level. Okay, with that said, I think I will stop for today, and I will see you tomorrow.